Well, good morning to everybody. It's really lovely to see, uh, to see you all here today. I'm very nervous, I have to tell you. And um, walking from uh, Exeter uh, Airport and, and coming here, I was thinking, oh, I could say this in my talk, I could say that. And it was changing as I was coming along, as was my sort of feelings. Uh, but I realise very clearly that I'm not just my feelings, I'm, I'm much more than that. So hopefully as I kind of settle in to talking about uh, what I'm going to share with you today, um, I'll just settle down and get back to, to who I really am. It never really goes away, it's always there. It's like those clouds kind of passing. So when you see me, what do you see? Is it me? someone you want me to be. Do you see what I see? How do you want me to change? And what makes you think I'd rearrange my life for you? You don't know me. I don't know me. Now, I didn't write that. <laughs> I didn't write that poem. That poem was written by a 16-year-old boy that I taught some time ago now. I went into education in my 30s, late 30s, I was 38. Before that, I would have told you I was a sort of thick, stupid, looked after, unintelligent woman. So I didn't actually go into education until my 30s. When I joined the community college that I sort of went into, the first thing that struck me was the art, I, I loved the arts and I was very involved in the arts. And the first thing that struck me was the drawings and the paintings around the walls. And it was sort of self-portraits, portraits of, portraits of pets, uh, still lives, pop groups. And I just thought, what does this tell me about anybody that I'll be teaching in this school? What does this, who are these people? I was given a tougher end of the spectrum class. They said, you know, you're a mature uh, student coming in or a, a, a graduate coming in, so, and they won't know, so we'll give you this particular class. And I remember thinking, something struck me very clearly then. I need to find out who I'm, who I'm with. I need to start listening to these students. So I was saying to them, where do you get an opportunity to tell staff where you're coming from, who you are, your beliefs, your values? What are you thinking? And they, they honestly said, we don't get that opportunity. So I then asked the staff, and they said, well, if you get in a decent tutor group, a tutor might ask you those questions, but it doesn't really happen. So I very quickly, first year of going into education, took a master's degree and, and did something called, ad uh, I, I called it the um, Adolescent Development and its relationship to art and design education at the time, nicknamed the Identity Project. And the boy that wrote that, I asked three questions. How do you see yourself? How would you like to be seen? How do you think other people see you? They seemed like the most logical questions to ask at the time. So the boy that wrote this, one of his pictures is up here. And this, this lad over here was talking about, he's got so many thoughts, no one wants to listen to them. He wants to share them. He looked like an ordinary student, sort of no real problems that I could see on the surface but he had all this stuff going on in his head. This one too, this represents his thoughts underneath, and he was describing his thoughts to me. As we were going through the project, they were talking about their sexuality, their religious beliefs, uh, their parents' beliefs, a lot of sort of questioning their own thinking. They were keeping journals, they were writing poetry, they were writing letters, some of them anonymous, that came uh, upon my desk in the morning, and it really got me thinking. This lad was talking about information coming in, information coming in, but who was interested in who he really was? This particular girl, she's got this um, advent calendar here. This one's got a lock on it, so no one's going to see in there. I noticed that her mouth was very tiny. She felt that no one really wanted to hear what she was saying. So there were these students going around with lots and lots of feelings and thinking, and I didn't have this understanding there was a real uh, connection in our lessons to the point where they were coming back until nine o'clock in the evening. 
you know, long days, and students who weren't even involved in taking art were also coming back and asking if they could do the project. So as a result of that, I thought, oh, there's something for me to learn here. So I went off and I did, I did some counselling training. I was still sort of teaching at the time. Um, I did some coaching training. Um, I, I went on to become kind of an executive coach, but it, it, still I felt something was missing for these, for these students, and I felt that I was selling them short. And as I went through my career in education, I began to run a school, um, and was still asking very similar questions, but then ended up w working with the adults more than the, the children on things like this. <laughs> I wondered what this project would be like if I took it out to a primary school and to a high school, and what if I asked older people? Would they come up with the same sort of images? And I just wanted to show you the picture from a child from a primary school. And for me, this is full of hope and promise and optimism. Uh, I think it shows the resilience. It shows all the things that we talk about in the principles. And I thought, what happens? What happens to that between this primary school age beautiful child and the beautiful people that I was teaching as sort of 16, 17-year-olds then? And then I thought, well, we educate them. And we educate them inside school and outside of school. And it just really got me thinking. I took myself off to... I, when I left the academy, I retired um, about two and a half years ago. I had an opportunity to go and take a doctor. I was so into coaching and empowering and working with people. And that's what I thought I'd do until I heard... That there was a quote by Sidney Banks. And I thought, I've got to find out more about this man and what he does. And I joined... Uh, Jamie Smart's Clarity Coaching course. My first weekend in that room, I just thought, this is some sort of cult. I could have gone and, I could have gone and joined this sort of doctorate course. I saw people hugging each other. I felt that they knew something that I didn't know. Um, and I thought, why on earth am I here? And I had a training on the Monday to do. And um, I was very nervous, very anxious about that. It was a new training, new school. I was going into a primary. I'm secondary trained. Uh, so I had a lot of anxious thinking about that that weekend. And I'm not sure that I really felt that I heard anything that could help me, if I'm totally honest. I heard a lot about ego. I heard a lot about my true self. Um, but I didn't feel I was getting it, to the point where on the Sunday I wrote to Jamie Smart and said, this isn't the course for me, I should have gone somewhere else. I didn't quite say, can I have my money back, but I was at that point. And then uh, on the Monday, the Monday came, and I, I went into the training, and I met the head teacher there, who was a, a lovely woman who I coach to this day. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, I had all my carefully prepared PowerPoints and I knew what I was going to say. I was training people to be coaches. And I remember thinking, it's like, if I just fainted now, if I could just fake a heart attack, if I, could just, I won't have to do this. I'd sort of really got up in my own head. I mean, a bit today, but nothing like, nothing like I was then. But my carefully prepared PowerPoints and everything that I was doing kind of didn't matter, and I didn't use them in the same way. And when I spoke to the members of staff that were there, I really spoke to them. I noticed a difference. Now, I couldn't tell you at the time what that difference... There was something... Something had changed within that one weekend. And I remember drawing on the board, um, and, and some of you will be familiar with this, but I remember drawing a diamond like this and talking about this sort of butterfly image, and, and saying how... I remember listening... I think it was Aaron Turner who was saying that he had a friend who was a midwife, and she watches new babies born and coming into the world, and she sees... She stares them in the eyes, and she sees this hope and possibility and innate wisdom and wellness, and they're not broken, they don't need fixing, and that's us, that's how we come into the world. And then something... Somewhere along the line, we start, to, like these teenagers, to pick up messages and we say, well, this is us, and this diamond gets coated in kind of lumps of poo. And especially when you're a, a professional, I should think any of us, we don't want people to see that poo. That's, you know, we don't want people to see... And I thought, 
that's who I am. I don't want people to see this. So what we do is coat that in a layer of varnish and hope to goodness that no one sees through that varnish or that, that varnish doesn't crack. Because if this varnish is, if this cracks, they'll see what's inside. But the truth is, for every single person in this room, and I include myself, we're this, this diamond. That's who we are. That's our resilience and our resourcefulness and our innate well-being, and it, it's all who we were born to be. But we get so sucked into sort of media and other people's opinions, like that poem said initially. So I left the training, got on really well with the staff, loved it, uh, su was surprised, and I caught the train back to Norfolk. And when I was on the train, a little voice in my head, that sort of consciousness, said, come on, Terry, it's just you and me now. Do you really believe what you were telling the people in that room? Do you honestly believe that? I was on my own, and I'm used to be much more self-critical than I am now. And I thought, I absolutely believe that to be true. You know, cut me open like a stick of rock. That's the truth as far as I'm concerned. And then this little voice again, well, is that true for you? Is what the voice said. And do you know what? I can honestly tell you that hadn't occurred to me. So counselling... Uh, NLP practitioner, master practitioner, trainer, uh, executive coaching and mentoring, ILM level seven. Not once. It was all about how can I support other people? How can I help them be the best they can be? But it hadn't once occurred to me. Me too. It hadn't once occurred to me. So the voice said, you know, well, if it's not true for you, you've shot your own theory in the foot. It's either true or it's not true. It's the truth or not the truth. And in that carriage on the way back from that training, I knew that this understanding, the truth about who we really are, was for me too. So it wasn't whilst I was with Jamie Smart in a training room, it was just in a carriage, on a train, on my own. So, yes, I've started, I, I coach people. That's what I do for a living. I go out. Um, I also work in schools. I work with various people. could be any... Uh, you know, I'm working with a CEO from an American company at the moment. But I've also worked with um, an old-age pensioner who didn't want to go to her death with the thinking that she had. And bless her, the, the difference is unbelievable. In a recent primary school, I was asking them, we were talking about sort of who they really were. Bless them, they were saying, well, if we chop our arms off, that's not who we are, and if we chop our legs off, that's not, and we can have a kidney transplant. We were working out what you could do without to kind of work out who they really were. And we were talking about how those, our thinking kind of just passes, if we let it, rather than grabbing hold of it and making sense, saying, well, this is who we are. You know, I'm an angry person, a sad person, a dyslexic person, and so on. That's not who we are. We are the seer of those thoughts. And then I asked these children, so what's in your diamond? No, absolutely no pressure from me to say anything. These are the words this small group of five came up with. Now, I didn't tell them that. They innately knew that. These boys, the, the head said to me, can you just come in? We've got 10 boys. I don't want to say the word unteachable. There were, there were five boys who were disengaged from learning for one reason or another, and, and, and five who were really struggling. And I met the most amazing children that day, and I had some thinking before I got into that school, because I thought, from the descriptions I'd had from other people's, other people's belief systems about the people that they were with, um, I was nervous. I thought, Who, who's going to be in front of me? And these boys were just amazing. And, and these are their words again. We are powerful. They spoke about mind. And one lad, there was one lad. They, uh, there's so many lovely stories I want to tell you, and I haven't got the time. But there was one lad 
and uh, we were sat round a table, we were having fun and talking about this understanding. They, they get it, they get it so much quicker than we do. Um, and I looked at him and, I, and there was just a lovely feeling in the room and I said to him, how are you feeling right now? How are you feeling right this minute, right now? And he just looked me in my eye and he said, I feel loved. You know, he had his peers around him, there were other people in the room. I think when our children feel that love and they know that they are innately well, not broken, not in need of fixing, resilient, resourceful, as Liz was saying earlier, then that opens the pathway to all sorts of new learning. Thank you.